begin at an intersection in Denver, one that's been the source of a mystery for years. In this hot real estate market, the old Kmart property at Monaco and Evans has been sitting stone cold silent. 13 enormous acres ripe for development, empty for eight years now. Our Steve Steger has learned there's finally something happening. I grew up in southeast Denver and I have memories of shopping at that Kmart when I was about five years old. But the fond memories faded fast for Denver City Councilwoman Kendra Black. Since she took office, this Kmart has been the biggest complaint to her office. A lot of people dump their trash behind it. We get complaints a lot and have to go clean it up. When we first told you this story in March of last year, we found a plasma TV in the parking lot. When we pulled up this week, we may have found the rest of the living room that went with it. And perhaps part of a bedroom too. It closed in 2011 and it's just been a blight on the community. A blight that the city's been trying to fight with citation after citation taped to the boarded up front door. The people who owned the, the Kmart built it in the 60s and they had a 99 year lease with Kmart. And then some years ago, Sears bought Kmart. And though it was closed, Sears kept paying the lease for some reason until last year when it went bankrupt. And now suddenly the out-of-state owners were willing to sell. Forum Real Estate had reached out to me and told me that they had a contract to purchase it. Forum Real Estate is a local company known for developments like the Lazy River apartment complex near I-25 in Hamden. No word on what they plan to do just yet. Everyone is really happy that it sold and um, happy to be moving forward with something. So you may still be thinking, with property values this high, why did it take so long for the owner to decide to sell 13 acres instead of just ch or cashing a lease check? So on this 13 acres, the Goldsmith Drainage Gulch which actually runs right underneath the parking lot here, which means you cannot build too tall over that part of the property. So Black tells me Denver Wastewater wants to open up that gulch to make an even bigger green space in that area. But wait, 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 these are the Lazy River people. I'm wondering if that had something to do with the property. They're thinking Lazy River here. Genius, genius. Can't wait for the Lazy River. Through Can't the believe I didn't think of that. Kmart parking lot, how about that? Thank you, Steve. Democratic Governor Jared Polis's office put pressure on two small town newspapers recently to take down an article that was not favorable to the governor. The article is accurate. It describes how Governor Polis has created another new government office in Colorado. Both newspapers eventually refused the request from the governor's office. I want to show you the article. So I, like a lot of small news outlets these days, the Trinidad Chronicle News and the Cuyahoga County Press republish content that comes from other sources. And this article comes from the center square. It covers government with what it calls a taxpayer's sensibility. So let's be honest, all right? It's, it's fiscally conservative. That's their deal. And there are similar outlets that produce factual coverage, but with an acknowledged point of view, social justice or environmentalism, consumer protection. But then Polis's spokesman, Connor Cahill, asked the newspapers to remove that online article. Cahill says that Center Square is a partisan organization funded by the Koch brothers. So now this is where it gets awkward because Governor Polis himself shared a Center Square article, one that was favorable to him. It was an article about three months ago talking about job growth in Colorado. Very positive. It appeared on the Montrose Daily Press website, and the governor was happy to share it on his Facebook page. The editor of the Trinidad Chronicle News told me he initially didn't think that Governor Polis's office was serious about taking down that accurate but unflattering article. Eric John Monson from the newspaper down in Trinidad told me today he was flabbergasted, disheartened, and dismayed that the governor's office would pressure him. Good for those small town news outlets for standing their ground against the governor. These days, rural newspapers, they're struggling to stay afloat and to fill their pages, and their limited staffs are working as hard as they can to serve their communities. Governor Polis and his team should understand that accurate but unflattering news coverage comes with the job. They should leave those journalists alone. There are thousands of families in Colorado who would not view the trip to the doctor as a pain but is a privilege because right now they don't have health insurance and the number of uninsured kids in our state is growing. Our Anusha Roy looks at why. 
In the last year, another 20,000 kids were added to a group to the dismay of the Colorado Health Institute, a group of kids living without any kind of health insurance, bringing the total to roughly 54,000. There are the constant obstacles like cost, access to doctors, especially in rural Colorado, and some families priced out of Medicaid and the state-administered insurance program that makes health care affordable. But then researchers found the biggest spike of kids without insurance was in the Hispanic Latino community. Community. As for why, one factor researchers studied is an immigration policy change that could impact people in the country legally. It's a change that led some families to think using programs like Medicaid could impact their chances to stay in the country long term, like getting a green card. It also means a lot of the kids who no longer have coverage are most likely U.S. citizens. So those finalized rules are going into effect October 15th. They don't mention Medicaid impacting green card applications if kids are using it. But they talked to an immigration lawyer who said he's not surprised by all of this and that the rules are even confusing for mm -hmm. lawyers who are still trying to interpret all of this. And it's just a matter of weeks away. Number of organizations in our state focused on the mm -hmm. welfare of kids and trying to fill those gaps. What do they think that they can do? Yeah, so as you can imagine, they're pretty disappointed because they mm -hmm. did a lot of work. The numbers were going down for the last decade, and then we started seeing the reverse happen. They said one thing that they would like to do is try to shore up the state-run program just to make it more accessible, make it stronger, hopefully to reach more families in Colorado. Right. Anusha, thank you very much. Congressman Ken Buck, who does double duty as the chairman of Colorado's Republican Party, said today that impeachment proceedings against President Trump are all about Democrats trying to overturn an election that didn't go their way. Well, wait till Ken Buck finds out that Colorado Republicans have run six recall campaigns against Democrats who won elections. I'm sure that Buck won't find that to be very sportsmanlike either. Now, America has never removed a president through impeachment. Our Chris Vanderveen looks at how judges are the ones who have been booted. There it is, Article 2, Section 4, impeachment. Some framers of the Constitution didn't want it in there. Others did. The others won. Impeachment always begins in the House of Representatives. A simple majority decides to impeach. If that happens, it's up to the U.S. Senate to try the case. To convict, a two-thirds vote, 67 senators in all must agree. If that happens, the president is out. Vice president is in. But that has never happened. The House voted to impeach two presidents, Andrew Johnson in 1868 and Bill Clinton in 1998, but the Senate acquitted both. Richard Nixon was facing almost certain impeachment in 1974 when he resigned. And while presidents have escaped official removal, some judges haven't been so fortunate. Congress has forced eight out in its history. The last time, 2010, when the Senate, by an overwhelming majority, voted to remove Judge G. Thomas Porteous from the federal bench. It was a busy day in Washington. Some Senate Republicans joined with Democrats to try and block President Trump from taking money out of military projects to fund his border wall. Colorado's Republican Senator Cory Gardner again stood by the president on this, even after the Trump administration diverted $8 million from Peterson Air Force Base in the Springs. This is the second time that the Senate has voted on the Trump administration's border wall funding plan. After the first vote, Senator Gardner's team came out and said that he had personal assurances that no Colorado projects from fiscal year 2019 would be impacted. A few months later, fiscal year 2018 funds were taken away from Peterson Air Force Base. For weeks now, we've been asking Senator Gardner's staff whether the senator knew that Colorado could lose money when he was out there publicly promising that Colorado would be spared cuts. We've been trying to figure out did the Trump administration pull a fast one on Gardner, or did Gardner know that we could lose a military project when he seemed to indicate otherwise? Once again today, Senator Gardner's spokeswoman would not answer that question. RTD's whole lot of nothing could become something in downtown Denver. Told you last night that RTD's elected directors were about to change their minds in a big way, and they did. RTD's directors unanimously approved letting a proposed National Medal of Honor Museum use that whole lot of nothing at Colfax and Lincoln. It was last week when directors rejected giving their vacant lot to the museum project. Director Kate Williams last week said she didn't understand why such a museum was even needed. Said it was park space would just fill up with homeless people. Last night, Director Williams offered a public apology for her comments. We still don't know if the Medal of Honor Museum is going to come to Denver. The foundation that's building it is still deciding between our city and Arlington, Texas. Look for the decision 
next month. It's a school bus where kids get on and they don't get off. We are a magic school bus. For many of them, it's their only opportunity for early learning. I know that some of these families wouldn't be in preschool otherwise, if not all of them. And everybody knows Denver's Federal Boulevard. So let me ask you, what's so federal about it? That question stumped me. Next. Everywhere you look these days, you'll see CBD products being used to treat some kind of medical condition, including arthritis. And the Arthritis Foundation is actually out with new guidelines for people to follow if they plan on using a CBD product. But the feds have only approved CD CBD as a treatment for epilepsy. And a local doctor who's done a lot of work with medical marijuana and cannabis products thinks that the Arthritis Foundation has really crossed a line here. There are health officials, even people in the CBD industry, who have come on next to tell you that they do not know enough about how CBD works. Companies that advertise it for a specific use can get in trouble with federal regulators. So then you bring in Dr. Ken Finn, who's practiced pain medicine in Colorado Springs for decades. He's done a lot of work with the state regarding medical and recreational marijuana. He goes so far as to call the Arthritis Foundation's new guidelines reckless. There's a lot of things out there that we don't know much about, but that doesn't mean that if people are using it anyways, you can't say, well, if you're going to use it anyways, that's okay. But if you're going to use it anyways, start using it like this. Uh, I think that's uh, malpractice if you want to take it to the, to the extreme. The Arthritis Foundation told us that CBD may be controversial, the scientific research may be lacking, but the foundation said that people with arthritis are not waiting to treat their pain. They're using CBD today. And that's why they're hoping the federal government will expedite study and regulation of CBD products. Halfway through the first week of fall and another beautiful day with blue skies and temperatures close to average. In Denver, a few high clouds off to the west. And if that makes for a pretty sunset where you are, send that picture in. I'll post it here on 9 News later tonight. A little bit cooler today with the arrival of a weak dry front that will be well south and east of us tomorrow. Low pressure cut off from the main flow in the southwest. And that's where we'll see the really active weather in the next 24 hours. Here, calm, quiet, and comfortable. Low 50 tomorrow with sunshine. Temperatures in the mid to upper 80s close to 90 ahead of a cool front that will bring cooler and wet weather to us on Friday. Highs in the upper 60s and lower 70s with a 30 to 40 percent chance of showers here and maybe a little light snow over some of the higher peaks, kind of calling it frosting on the mountains for those wonderful Aspen pictures you all have been sending in. Good looking weekend coming up and then another storm that we're tracking for Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. Kathy, thank you. All right, so you ever have a question, a curiosity, something that gets so stuck in your mind that you can't function until you, you've scraped it out with an answer. A viewer named Mark came to next with his sticky question. How did one of Denver's busiest streets get its name? Because Mark couldn't find anything federal along Federal Boulevard. And Mark, you're correct. But that street has been effed for a long time. Federal Boulevard, the top to bottom stripe on Denver's west side, has more international eats than anywhere in town, and it has too few crosswalks. But Federal doesn't have anything federal on it. The government's federal center is miles away. The Denver Library says that street used to be called Highland Avenue. Denver reorganized streets in 1897, went alphabetical, and it became Boulevard F. Just F. Perhaps someone figured that when you think of an F word, you think of the government in Washington. So in 1912, Boulevard F became federal by Sydney Ordinance. And that's the lowdown on Denver's cruising capital. So nowadays, federal is surrounded by other streets that are named after famous Americans. So it all kind of fits together. But the Library and History Colorado tell us that that came after Boulevard F became federal. And since it fit, the city just left it. Some of the youngest learners in our state weren't getting the education they needed. So it makes it harder to be able to move into the next grade without some of those skills. So a former teacher decided to bring the classroom to them. And what's the guy in the harness doing hanging from a helicopter? Apparently, his job. That's next. The school bus is literally and figuratively a vehicle, way to get kids from home to school. In Thornton, there's a bus that is the school. Lori Lizarraga got on board. 
In a quiet neighborhood just off West Thornton Parkway, there is a school bus. Jacob, do you know what this is? Pumpkin. It's a pumpkin. It doesn't serve you know the standard pick up and drop off service. Good night, stars. Good night, Good night air. Good night, air. Good night, noises everywhere. The school bus Good night. is the school. Good night, cow jumping over the moon. Just because we all know that. Um, preschool is super important, but it's not easy for everyone to access that. This rolling classroom makes it easier for 16 children, eight in Federal Heights, eight in Woodland Hills. Mm -hmm. Who might not otherwise go to preschool. Preschool isn't free in Colorado. A lot of families can't afford it. The cost is a barrier for a lot of families, and so we are able to reduce that. Here, there isn't a charge. Alexa Garrido and her husband started this project, and they're passionate about that. Remember who we are behind, we're making a life. Alexa calls it equal opportunity. And then to be able to move from preschool into kindergarten with all the same skills as other kids are having. She knows they're laying an educational foundation for these children. Long term, we want to see them ready for kindergarten. It might be unorthodox to hold class inside a 20 foot bus, but today, here in Thornton, this is what equal opportunity looks like. Bye, Andy. I'll see you tomorrow. For next, I'm Lori Lizarraga. The Right On Mobile Education School Bus Program is raising money now to expand its preschool program by two more buses to serve two more child care deserts. It's a sign, and it is an attention getter for sure. Our viewer Peggy saw this on Highway 34 up near Grand Lake, and Peggy was probably thinking, what do you mean? I, I, I haven't taken a drug test in years. Why is that sign asking me about that? Apparently, it was a recycled sign. That's why the poles are on the side we're looking at. The other side is the one that they want drivers to see. That was warning about a construction zone. So it only looks like you're in trouble. I will show myself out. Send us the signs you see. Next at 9news.com is the email or get our attention with the hashtag. Hey, next. Hanging from a helicopter, a guy is headed for power lines. Sounds like a bad idea, but it's just his job. That and your feedback next. You've taught us that people can make a living doing almost anything, even the stuff that makes you say, that's a job? Dangling from a helicopter while working on power lines. That's a job. A next viewer named Randy saw these Excel workers out threading power lines near the Southlands Mall in Aurora yesterday afternoon. The linemen are setting up some new lines to go to a substation that's east of Gun Club Road. Excel says they don't always do this type of dangly helicopter work. It depends on what kind of other access they have to the area. It depends on the overall cost of the project. This is highly technical. Only linemen and apprentices are allowed to do this work, and only after they get four years of special training. Brian Brun writes in tonight to say that he noticed that we held both Republican and Democratic elected officials to account on the program. Brian writes, this is why I love this show. You guys do a great job on calling out both sides on issues. Brian, that's what we try to do. Hold everybody to the same standard. It's up to them how often they cross the line. 